go to go with me to the Matthew chapter 3 verse 11 verse 17 I don't want to wear your patience I thank you again for your consistent hospitality you treat treat a brother like me this good it's hard to get him to go home <laughs> Matthew 3 11 when you have it say man you already know don't you <laughs> Amen. It is my custom to stand on your feet for the reading of God's word. After that, you can sit all night if you want. But Matthew 3, verse 11. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John. Somebody say, my name is John. Yeah, yeah. Then come of Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. And lo, the heavens were open unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased, so says the scriptures. Remain standing for a moment. I, I want to talk to you from the simple subject, the next dimension. The next dimension. Some are in it, and some are on the verge of it, and some have never thought of it. But I want to talk about the next dimension. Spirit of the living God, if you would, fall fresh on me tonight. Not one soul really came to hear me. They want to hear you speak. And not only they, but me too. I, I, I want you to preach out me what you preached in me. Uh, teach out of me what you taught into me. Let it, let it flow unhindered and unrestrained. Bind every principality and power that would, would try to interrupt the flow of what you would do in this place tonight. I sense, oh God, somebody's hungry. Break thou the bread of life and feed us till we want no more. In Jesus' mighty and righteous name we pray. Somebody who loves him, say amen. amen. You may be seated. On your way down, tell your neighbor I'm headed to the next dimension. Last night I introduced my brother to you. The whole context of the text is centered around an introduction whereby we would have an understanding of who John is. Not so much John the character in the scripture, but what he represents to us is a departure from routine. A moving away from ritualisms and false humility and sanctimonious ideologies into a thrust and a flow of God that sometimes can disrupt those of us who only find comfort in normalcy. There are some of us whose goal in life is to simply maintain the status quo. <laughs> Just don't rock the boat. <laughs> 
in my book when I was sitting uh, out on the back deck writing instincts I began to talk a lot about in the book about leadership because there is a dearth uh, in our country and in our churches and in our world for true leaderships most people are just placeholders They, they get an office and a title to tell you that they have arrived and then once you give them the office and the title, there is no further movement at all. I don't understand how you can be a leader and not have movement. If a car is not moving, it's parked and I, I just... I just don't understand how, how lead, but, but then again, when I think about it, I, I wrote that there are often two types of leaders, and I drew it from a metaphor about building a fire. One type of leader is a builder, and the other type is a banker. Well, you, you all are too young to know about banking a fire, but there's a difference between how you position wood when you're building a fire, and how you throw ashes on it when you're banking it. It's all about position. The same tools are used, but how those tools are positioned determines the outcome of the fire itself. If you want it to burn right, you have to build it right. Uh, if, you, if you want it to, to bank and keep it warm all night, then you develop a different position whereby the goal is to throw enough ashes into the open spaces that you slow down the progress of burning and maintain a certain level of heat without total combustion because there is not enough airflow to produce the level of fire to which is possible for wood that can move through unhindered spaces and air that can ventilate that positioning. It's all about positioning and how you think. The difference between building and banking. It's a, it's a lot of difference between the two. Do you, do you get up out of the bed in the morning to maintain what you have? Or do you want to increase what you have? God is not offended by increase. The very first thing he told Adam to do in the garden was to be fruitful. He said, I want you to do something with what I gave you. That's the distance of your leadership. The, where you took it from where you got it to where it goes determines the length and breadth and impact of your leadership. Not your credentials, not your titles, not your car, not your Porsche, not your house, not your accolades. Are you moving the thing forward or are you maintaining it? To me, it is the difference between uh, uh, a preschool and a nursery. They both take in children, but the, the object of the nursery is just to keep the kids safe till mama comes and gets them. But the object of preschool with the same, with the same kids is to leave the kids better then you found them. And so the question comes, are the people under your leadership tutelage, whether you're a pastor or not, it can be a choir, it can be your family. Did you leave them better or did you just babysit them until the master comes? John was radical. He was different and the frustration as I tried to indicate last night, the frustration with those who gathered around him is that they wanted him to fit in. When, when you are really a leader, you have to give up on the need to fit in. Yeah, because real leadership will stand out. Real leadership will take risk. And I must warn you that real leadership is controversial. You, 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 <laughs> you can't be a leader and be preoccupied with the worries of what people are saying about you. I'm afraid today we have too many people in too many positions who are more worried about whether people like them than they are worried about accomplishing their purpose. When your goal is to be liked by people, you will let them name you whatever they need to name you to be accepted in the ranks you want to be accepted in. But the moment you stand up and say, my name is not Zacharias Jr., my name is John, expect people to have a problem with you. 
And they had a problem with John because he did not go in and dress the lamps and tend the tables of shoe bread and function with the same methodology. Though he had the same position as his father, he had a deviation in function. He was strong enough to stand out. He was big enough to be radical. He was tough enough to be different. He was tough enough to take a licking and keep on ticking. And even though he did not do his thing in the temple, the Bible said he went out in the wilderness and, and made the wilderness his temple. Because when you got it, nobody can stop you from doing what you do when you get ready to do it. You can't stop me from what I am. I'm going to say that again because I want that to sink way down. You can't stop me from what I am. You can lock me up in jail and I can do it in a prison. You can throw me in a pit and I'll get out of a pit. You can lie on me and detain me. You may delay me, but you can't deny me. You can't stop me from what I am. That's a, that's a good tweetable right there. Look at your neighbor and say, you can't stop me from what I am. You can stop calling me that. You can stop acknowledging me. You can stop recognizing me. You can talk about me. You can blog about me. You can tweet about me. But you can't stop me from what I am. And since you can't stop me from what I am, why should I make my mission to change your mind? Some of you have misplaced your mission and given up on what you were called to do and you're spending all of your life trying to convince your critics that they got it wrong. But truly great men are understood better in death than they are in life. Uh, some of the men that we revere right now in real time speed, they were not revered the way they are revered post-mortem. People love dead heroes, but when you're living, they have an issue with you. And the test of your leadership is to be able to take a licking and keep on ticking, to stand flat-footed and say, I said what I said and I meant it just like I said it. It sounds like there's some leaders up in here somewhere. So what if he's not in the temple? So what if he's not invited to the circle of priests? So what if he's not in their fraternity than in their lodges? So what if he's not invited out to dinner? So what if they didn't buy him a suit when he came? So what if he had to dress up in camel hair? So what if he never went out to dinner? He made his meal off of wild locusts and honey because when you got it, God will find a way to feed you. When you don't eat what losers eat, you don't lose like losers lose. If you change your diet you'll change your direction so John goes down 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 yes he goes down into the wilderness he goes into the wilderness no platform no stage no recognition no honorarium he goes into the wilderness and preaches till folks start running out of the city to come into the wilderness it doesn't matter where you are if you got what you got people will drive to get to something that is life changing i wish i had a witness out there somewhere and so John has begun to minister and it is Jesus actually later that makes us understand that John was quite controversial. He said that because John ate wild locusts and honey and dressed in camel's hair, they thought he was a devil because to the small mind, anything different is demonic. So they will categorize you in a place for their comfort rather than to be challenged by your progress. It is easier to say you are a devil because that becomes a disguise and an excuse for my incompetence to be progressive. So John, oh God help me, I'm helping somebody, I don't know who it is. Somebody knows what it is to be blackballed. Somebody knows what it's like to be on the blacklist. Somebody knows what it's like for people to grin in your face and stab you in the back and you know they don't mean you any good but what God has for you my brothers and sisters it is for you they, they won't know what you mean but tell them my name is John 
I don't have to fit in your mold. I don't have to look like you. I don't have to be invited to your sorority. I don't have to be in your clique and in your club. Go ahead and roll your eyes. Text your friends while I'm preaching. But you'll never be able to stop me from being what I am. For he whom the Son has set free is free indeed. Your chains cannot hold me. Your handcuffs cannot hold me. Is there anybody loose in this place? Let some loose radical preacher, some loose woman, some loose first lady, some loose evangelist open up your mouth and shout! I know, I know you bothered them when you made that noise, but we don't even care if you're nervous. If you're nervous, take a pill because we're getting ready to be crazy in here tonight. Somebody say yes. So John proceeds, I'm just talking, John, John proceeds uh, about his mission. He is excommunicated from the commonwealth of the theologians of his day. He is not allowed at the council of those who are accustomed to a certain level of orthodoxy. He is radical, almost cultish in his demeanor. He is criticized in his disposition. He is rejected from their council, but he preaches in the desert until people leave the city to hear him. Uh, the moment that we look at in our text is most profound because it is that moment where mercy and truth are met together, where righteousness and peace have kissed each other. It is the moment where destiny collides at the Jordan, at the Jordan River at the Jordan River. It will always happen around a river, a moving body of water, because we have a God that is a moving God. From the very first mention of him in the book of Genesis, where it says the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, to the final selections of revelations, where it says, even so, come Lord Jesus. Our God is either moving or coming. He is the God on the move. He is the movement not a monument. If he's a fire, he's a mighty unquenchable fire. If he's a wind, he's a mighty Russian wind. If he's water, he's living water. Wherever God is, he will move whatever he's in. He will move it. He will change it. And when they come down to the Jordan, when John comes down to the Jordan, it is symbolic of getting into the pre-existed flow. You do not create the flow, you find it. Too many times we are trying to create a flow that needs to be discovered. The flow is already there and if you step into the flow, things will begin to shift. In spite of the fact that they called him a devil and, and criticized him, John, that old preaching devil, has come down into the flow. And when he comes down into the flow, all of those that heard him came with him until a multitude has stepped into the flow. See, you cannot lead people into a flow that you are not in yourself. <laughs> You can quote it, you can teach it, you can talk it, you can powerpoint it, but they will never go where you have not been. If you want people to get in the flow, you've got to be the first partaker of the fruit. And so we see John coming down into the flow. The Jordan River stands betwixt and between fruitfulness and dryness. On one side of the river, there are the grapes, the land that flows with milk and honey, and the clusters of grapes so big that the generation in the wilderness was so excited about it that they withstood Jericho to get into the fruitfulness after 40 years of dryness. When you've been dry a long time, 
and you can see fruit you're excited they saw it on the dry side but they had to cross the Jordan to get into the next dimension oh so close and yet so far sometimes you can see it but you can't taste it yeah you 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 can explain it but you can't do it you can teach it but you can't perform it but John doesn't get to the Jordan and back up even though he has spent his ministry in the wilderness he now steps off of the dry parched land that that has identified him as a wilderness preacher and he comes and steps into the flow because when you get in the flow you can see things that you cannot see in the dry when you get into the flow you get revelation and perspective that you would not get otherwise when you get into the flow that's where things are living that's where things are moving that's where fish are swimming it's all in the flow it's in the flow it's in the flow as long as you have got blood flow you are alive that's why they check your pulse to see if you are living because anything that's not moving is dead the lack of flow is a sign that you are dead that's why they call money currency because in order for it to be powerful it has to flow and if money stops flowing it loses its power you can't clutch it you gotta loose it and let it flow and John has stepped down into the flow and I am a living witness that if you ever find your flow no devil in hell can stop you from being what you are created to be somebody in this building knows what I'm talking about after 20 years of trying to figure it out you have finally stepped into your flow some people don't get in their flow until they're 40 years old some people don't find it until they're 50 years old you can tell you're in your flow when you can stand flat-footed and say I am who I am I can do what God says I can do and I can have what God says I can have nudge your neighbor and tell him I'm in my flow <laughs> yeah yeah so don't try to bother me tonight because I'm in my flow don't try to hinder me because I'm in my flow don't try to curse me because I'm in my flow don't look at me with them beady eyes because I'm in my flow when you're in your flow they can talk about you at the barbershop but they can't stop you from doing what you do when you're in your flow John is now in his flow and from his flow he looks out and says behold behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sins of the world John has come from the desert to the Jordan. Jesus has come from the city to the Jordan. But they meet together in the flow. One point from the hand of John, the premier, prelate, preacher of his hour. One pointing of his finger. And Jesus, who was a stranger in the crowd, comes from obscurity to notoriety. Jesus has been in a desert too. It is not a physical desert, but it is a desert of 18 years of silence, of which we have no information. But after 18 years of silence, at the age of 30, he now comes out of the desert of silence of ambiguity and one point one pointing finger takes him from ambiguity to notoriety the crowd parts to see who he is. They do not recognize that the fella they've been pushing past is the fella they should have been looking to. <laughs> you, you know, sometimes uh, people only pay attention to people on the stage. But I want to warn you that sometimes the next great uh, is sitting somewhere out in the crowd. You knock them down trying to get to your seat. Never understanding that God was getting ready to point them out. Uh, I told you last night, don't sit beside nobody you don't like because I'm going to have you talking to them all night long look at your neighbor on the left and on the right and tell them I'm next I know I'm not up front right now but I'm next I know I had to park way over on the other side of the parking lot but I'm next I know I'm way up in the balcony and Bishop Jason looks like a pimple from where I'm sitting but don't let where I'm sitting fool you I'm next and when God gets ready to draw you one moment can push you from the background to the forefront, from being a no name to a great name. Behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. And in a flash, 
Jesus steps out of the crowd never to be anonymous again all of a sudden he steps out of the crowd and starts walking down to the Jordan this to me is a powerful moment Jesus the Lamb of God comes out of the crowd and steps down to the Jordan River and there Jesus and John meet at the Jordan you know the Jordan the Jordan, the outflow from the Sea of Galilee. You know the Jordan. That wall of separation between the people and the promised land. You know the Jordan. That body of water that flows into the Dead Sea. Representing your sins flowing into the sea of forgetfulness. Never to be remembered in this world or the world to come. You know the Jordan. It is that Jordan that Jesus now steps into and in a flash he comes down to the Jordan look at John we will understand later that this is their first recorded meeting and yet the wilderness preacher recognizes the city lamb don't know how he knew him but he knew him the people around him didn't know him but john knew him do not overlook the fact that he knew him his discernment his instinct is quite keen because he knows that one in the crowd is not like the rest of the crowd he stands out from the crowd he is different from the rest of them oh no 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 no, no. it wasn't his clothes because jesus dressed so much like the people of his day that the roman soldiers had to hire judas to point him out so he didn't stand out in his main brand clothes there was a something, 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 something different about you. Is there anybody in here that knows there's something different about you? I don't care what you put on, people always know there's something different about you. Even when you try to fit in, you stand out. There's a big, oh, here he comes, he's coming, he's coming, he's coming, he's coming. Touch everybody you can reach and tell him he's coming, he's coming, he's coming, he's coming, he's coming. The one that God has chosen, the one that God has set aside the one that God has predetermined he's coming tell every devil and warn every witch he's coming whenever Jesus shows up in a situation no hex no spell no incantation can stop his arrival he's coming and hell cannot stop it he's coming and demons cannot stop it he's coming and Satan cannot stop it he's coming and sin cannot stop it he's coming and flesh cannot stop it and he here he comes, a lamb walking on two legs, walking down, uh, walking down. <laughs> walking down, down, down into the Jordan. The lamb and the man step into the flow. John, who is busy baptizing, the pinnacle of his ministry, the earmark of his ministry, the brand of his ministry is baptism. But when he comes to Jesus, he says, oh, I cannot baptize you. You need to baptize me. It was Jesus' next word that got me. Suffer it to be so, that it might fulfill all righteousness. He says, this is important. We've got to do this to fulfill all righteousness. When I grew up in First Baptist in Charleston, West Virginia, my pastor told me that Jesus got baptized uh, to typify that Christians need to be baptized. Perhaps that, that is true, but, but I think it's more. Right. Seeing as this is one of the few, if not only, shadows in the New Testament, 
The baptism, you realize, is a shadow of the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord. We have left all the other shadows in the Old Testament, but this one protrudes. It is Jesus acting out what he would later fulfill. A shadow is an object seen in light. You cannot have a shadow unless you have an object seen in light. <laughs> and in the light of the revelation of his splendiferous glory, he cast a shadow in the Jordan that is fulfilled on the cross. Suffer it to be so. Let me run through this rehearsal. This baptism is a rehearsal. Let me run through this rehearsal so I can show you how to get into the next dimension. So let's practice this. And the Bible says he went down into the water. And that's when I realized Jesus and John standing with the water of Jordan rushing in between their legs. It is not only a shadow of what is to come, it is deja vu of what has already happened. These boys have not seen each other till they were standing in water before. You remember how John was trapped in the fluids of his mother's womb and the baby Jesus was in the fluids of his mother Mary and when they saluted one another both of them floating in water when they saluted John was filled with the Holy Ghost and here they are back in the water again They are. The, 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 the point I am laboring to try to articulate is that they are in the same place they were when we talked last night. But this time, they're in the next dimension. <laughs> yeah. Touch your neighbor and say, I'm in the next dimension. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. People, people try to say you changed and that you're acting funny. No, I'm still who I always was. I'm the same person, but I'm in the next dimension. I know I'm in the next dimension because things that used to bother me don't bother me anymore. People that used to get on my nerves don't get on my nerves anymore. In the first dimension, you stress me out, but in the next dimension, I can walk right through you. Oh, is there anybody in here in the next dimension? Take 30 seconds and praise God for where you are right now. When you are in the next dimension, you operate on a different level. You operate on a different plane. You have a different understanding. And when you get in the next dimension, you look at what used to impress you in the first dimension and you wonder, what did I see? Does anybody know what I'm talking about? You question your own eyes and say, what? You look at somebody you used to be in love with and you say, what was I? I wish I had some real people up in the Hampton tonight. I would set it off in here tonight. I would start a fire in here tonight. If I can find 10 folk with the Holy Ghost, I'm going to put these logs together and I'm going to burn something tonight. Slap somebody and say, let it burn, 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 let it burn. I didn't come to see your outfit. I came to set a fire. There, 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 
there, beloved, you need to understand it's time for the church to move to the next dimension. We have compassed about this mountain long enough, repeating the same old testimonies and the same old experiences and wrestling with the same old committee, listening at the same old lies. We have compassed about it so long that when you open up your mouth to say something, the people listening at you finish the sentence. I'm tired of preaching to church folk. I'm tired of preaching to folks who are looking at the clock and judging my message and trying to decide whether I have it or not. I'm tired of preaching to folk who call me dark. I want to preach to somebody who smells like cocaine, uh, smells like liquor, uh, climbed up out the sewer. Uh, I'm tired of waiting on the government to fix uh, what only the Holy Ghost can fix. Uh, we need to operate in the next dimension. You think you're a bad preacher? Roll up in one of them crack houses and start laying hands on people. If you really got some power, take your three points and your five Greek words and hit cell block B and go in there with the murderers and the rapists and the killers. It's time to take it to the next dimension. We have played with ourselves by ourselves long enough. Oh, oh, will y'all help me preach tonight? Touch everybody, you can reach us. Something's about to happen in here tonight. Something's about to happen. Everybody, you can reach. Tell them something's about to happen. Something's, something, something's about to happen. Something's about to happen in here tonight. Something's about to happen in here tonight. This is not going to be ordinary. This is not going to be ordinary. This is not going to be usual. This will not be a Zacharias Jr. service. This is going to be a John service. A break loose, break out, break over service. This is where God sets you on fire, blows on your wood, and causes you to burn again. The glory of the Lord is in this place. If you understand anything about glory, take five and give him your best praise right now. I'm not trying to shout you. I'm just, I'm just talking a little bit. I don't, I don't know how to do that fancy stuff, but, but I do like to think a lot. When, 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 when I was, when I was pondering, when I was pondering this whole notion of instinct, I went to the school of a lion and watched a lion raised in captivity born behind bars, raised in a zoo. The cage is the only world he's ever known. He has always eaten in the cage. At two o'clock the feeders come and slip it through the bars and he eats right over there in that corner. They bring the water over here and he drinks in that cage seeing that he has eaten and he now drinks and he has taken care of all of his biological needs in this world this vortex 
this matrix in which he lives, I ask myself, why? Why? Why does the lion pace in the cage? Why is he not comfortable in the cage? He's got water in there. He's got food in there. This is the only world he knows. Intellectually, this is the world because intellect is based on past experiences, things we've read, things we've heard, things we have seen. Intellect is composed of history. Mm -hmm. All of his history validates that this is the world. But why? Why is he pacing? Then I saw the trainer come and be careful to lock the door. If all the lion have ever known is the cage, why do they lock the gate? Come on, I'm up in a university. Somebody ought to answer this question. All of his intellect validates the cage. And yet they are meticulously careful to lock it. Because in spite of his intelligence telling him that his needs are met, his instincts... His instincts keep telling him there's something beyond that gate. I want to talk to somebody who's been pacing around in your life. And people don't understand why you aren't contented. You got some nice clothes. You got a pretty decent car. You got a house your mama would have been proud of. Why are you pacing around in that house? Pacing around in that church? Pacing around on that job? I submit to you, my brothers and sisters, is because down in your instinctive soul, there is a reminder there's something beyond this cage. Am I talking to anybody in here? I want to find somebody restless. I want to find somebody who wakes up in the middle of the night and stares out the window and just wonders, I just think there's something else for me beyond what I got. I want to find somebody who's stuck on a job, but you got a business in your belly and you're tired of going to the same job, looking at the same people, dealing with the same things because you're instincts keep telling you there's something beyond the cage who am I preaching to tonight if I'm preaching to you I came from Dallas to tell you the gate is open <laughs> touch your neighbor and tell him the gate is open now you got to make a decision. Am I going to stay where I'm comfortable? Am I going to stay where I'm comfortable? Or am I ready to go into the next dimension? Slap somebody who looks ready and say, let's go. Let's go. Let's go. You'll never be satisfied till you go. You'll never be fulfilled until you go. You'll never know what you got till you go. You'll never know what you can do till you go. You'll never go until you make up in your mind. I can't stay in here just because you like me in here. I'm tired of entertaining you with my confinement. Tonight is the night I break out of captivity. Tonight is the night. I do what's inside of me. Tonight is the night that I get out of this gate. And for the next three minutes, I want some radical. Wow! John the Baptist to give God a crazy Holy Ghost supernatural. your neighbor tell him there's something else for me there's something else for me I cannot die till I get
get out of this gate. Enough is enough. I'm ready to take it to the next level. Who's going with me tonight? Take a step into the next dimension. now if you saw what God had for you in the next dimension you really would praise him your eyes have not seen your ears have not heard neither have entered into your heart what God has for you watch this in the next dimension somebody step into it right now I'm going in to the next dimension I'm not going to live my life in another cage. The devil is a liar. Give your God some pain. the rabbi is teaching in his illustrated sermon is a principle of release that opens up the next dimension so he says to John I know you don't want to do this but in order for me to show you how to get into the next dimension suffer it to be so he went down in the water Nothing happened. Yeah. He went under the water. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing happened. But when he came up, all of a sudden another dimension opened up. I don't know who this is for, but after all the hell you went through, you got in trouble. God didn't say nothing. You got buried in it. God didn't say nothing. But when you get up, God. I, I, I don't want to. I don't want to wear your patience. Uh, I, I want to Something's about to open In somebody's life This is not an ordinary conference This is not a routine situation The reason God has ordered this anointing in this place is because when you come up, God's going to open up another dimension in your life. If I'm talking to you, give him some kind, just, I, I, just any kind of, I, I, I don't know how to... My final thought about going underwater. It is God acting out, going in the grave. That's where the transformation occurs. In the dark place. You can take a grain of wheat and it has a harvest in it, but you can't get it out until you put it in a. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
dark place. A man wants a son, but he cannot produce him until he plants him. In a dark place. Maybe we should stop saying buried. Because when you bury something, you don't expect it to get up. And the Lord told me to tell you that last dark place you went through. Hear ye the word of the Lord. That dark place that you went in and wondered where was God. That dark place that you went through. I have never known a great man or woman of God who did not go through a dark place. I don't care if he's going to be the king of Israel. He has to go through a dark place. I don't care if he's going to ride in a chariot behind the Pharaoh. He has to spend time in a prison. In a dark place. Babies gestate in dark places. Seeds root in dark places. Places. Destiny evolves in dark places. I never could understand when Peter tried to stop Jesus later from dying. He was trying to defend him and trying to stop him from going to the cross. And Jesus said, Get thee hence behind me, Satan. And on the other hand, when Judas came and kissed him. He called him friend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Seemed like you would have called Peter friend yeah, yeah, yeah. for trying to save your life and Judas a devil for trying to take your life. But he said, Peter, you're a devil because what you're trying to do will mess up my destiny. And Judas, even though you don't like me, you're still a friend because what you're about to do is go expedite my destiny. If you can receive what I just said, when you get home, call all of your friends, all of your enemies, call all of your haters, call all of the people who walked out on you and just text them and say, thank you. My destiny was in the dark place. You meant it for evil, but God made it good. And as soon as you come up, join hands with somebody right now, right now. Touch them right now. Touch them right now. Right now. You're touching somebody. Somebody in this stadium. You come to church. You sing the songs. You love the Lord. But you've been in a dark place. You've been pacing back and forth in a dark place. You're all dressed up. Your Gucci shoes in a dark place. Your Rolex watch in a dark place. Got on a Brioni tie. But you're in a dark place. Place. Look at that woman all dressed up, hair done, makeup laid. Nobody knows that the woman who looks the best is living in a dark place. Your marriage in a dark place. You smile in front of the people, grin and take pictures. Nobody knows that when you go home, you've been in a dark place. You feel buried in it. You feel trapped in it. Your situation is so complicated, you can't explain it to anybody. It's so personal, you can't divulge it to anybody. Nobody understands 
that you are in a dark place. You can't even understand why people are jealous of you. How could you be jealous of me when I'm living in a dark place? I can't understand why you would turn up your nose at me. Don't you see that when nobody's looking, I go home to a dark place. I can't get counseling. It's too complicated. I can't tell my friends because I can't trust them. So I'm doing the best I can, pacing around in this cage, trapped in this dark place. And here comes this country preacher from Dallas, Texas, and has the audacity to tell me, God has not buried me. He's only planted me. If he would have buried me, it would have mean I'm gone. But because he planted me, I'm about to come out of this. Squeeze your neighbor's hands. This is your last night in the dark place. This is your last night of pacing around in the cage. This is your last night of tasting your own tears. This is your last night of crying in a pillow, holding a pillow in the middle of the night. This is your last night. God is about to deliver you. You're about to see why the devil's been fighting you. He wouldn't be fighting you if God was through with you. He wouldn't be fighting you if you had no value. The only reason the devil is fighting you is because he knows that the heavens are about to open over your life. Squeeze that hand. Tell your neighbor, don't die. Don't die now. After all the hell you've been through, don't you die now. After all the nights you cried, don't die now. After all the pain you suffered, don't die now. You're on the verge of a great awakening. You're on the verge of a brand new miracle. You're on the verge of the next dimension. Squeeze that hand. Somebody's about to transport out of their pain, out of their problems, out of their struggle, out of their situation. Squeeze that hand. The person you're touching is on the verge of a miracle. Devil, you should have killed her when you had the chance. But I am coming out of this. Squeeze that hand. I'm coming out in the name of Jesus. I came to Hampton to tell you the heavens are opening over your life. Squeeze that hand. It's your last night. It's your last tear. It's your last pain. When you break loose, praise him like you lost your
Thank you, Hampton. Thank you, Jesus. I said, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I want to say this. I want to say this. I've been blessed to sit with the last three presidents of this country. I'm friends with some of the top CEOs around the world from producers, to actors, to entertainers. I've met the biggest of all of them. And in my research to write, the people who did the most amazing things, the Ted Turners, who started 24-hour news cycles when six o'clock news was all there was, the founders of Nike who looked at a waffle iron and a tennis shoe and threw a thousand dollars at it and started a company that's a multi-billion dollar corporation. The Oprah Winfrey's who walked away from a good job with good benefits which you were educated for to break out of the cage and do something you had never done before. When I wrote this book, Oprah said I could have wrote it myself. She said, because everything I ever did, I didn't know how to do it. I just had an instinct. See, if you have the instinct, you can hire people who know how. John Maxwell in one of his books says, if you know how to do a thing, you will always have a job. But if you know why they do it, they will always work for you. Intelligence is wonderful. It loads the gun. But instinct pulls the trigger. If you're going to move into what you sense in your spirit, you've got to move by instinct. Instinct moves with a timing. Do it now. Do it now. Sea turtles are born on the sand, never have been in the water. Their mama doesn't wait for them to hatch. They hatch by themselves, coming out of a dark place. The first thing they do is start crawling toward the water. Because when you find out where you fit, then you can flow in your gifts. Thank God for the people who wouldn't let you in. Their denial is God's direction. He puts it in you. I, it's just when I got saved. He told Jeremiah, before I formed thee, in the belly, I knew thee. I ordained you. I pre-wired you. I gave you everything you need to do what you need to do once you find where you fit. How am I going to find it? instinctively your gifts your talents think of what you do that when you do it you get energy from doing it think about the things that you do 
that creativity burst out of you when you're in that place and drop everything else that's got you busy with stuff that you shouldn't be doing and invest where you are instinctively gifted and God is going to bless your life. I sense I'm going to close. I'm sorry I was so long. Please forgive me. But when I got down into that lion cage thing, I sensed I was in the room with some people who've been pacing. And I want you to know, your gate is open. Wait, 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 wait. The only thing that's stopping you is fear. Before I leave the stage, can I pray for what you are afraid of? For some of you, it's going to be things that people said to you when you were a child. For some of you, it's going to be because you tried before and it didn't work. And the devil is always using your history to stop you from your destiny. For some of you, you're afraid because you don't have the resources. But if you can furnish the vision, God will send you the provision. Stop being afraid of what you were pre-designed to do. Join hands with somebody if, if they will. Don't force them because you either step into this or you don't. Tonight, Lord, I want to rebuke the spirit of frustration. Tonight, Lord, I come against the spirit of weariness. Some of us have paced ourselves to death. 30 years old and tired. 40 years old and out of gas. We're worn out from doing what we had to do and being what we were expected to be rather than doing what we were created to be. Now you said that you came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. You, you didn't say you came that we might have church and have it more abundantly. You said you came that we might have life. But Father, I see so many people having church who don't have life. And tonight, Lord, I don't know why you chose me to stand here these last two nights. But I believe you gave me a gift to impart to somebody in this room. I rebuke that voice that keeps telling you you're too old. I rebuke that voice that limits you by your gender. And says, no woman can do that. I rebuke that voice that says you don't have the right education. The devil is a lie. You got the right instinct. I rebuke that voice that says you don't have the money to fund the vision. The cattle on a thousand hills belongs to God. I rebuke the spirit of fear. The spirit of fear is stronger than fear itself. I rebuke the spirit of fear. You will turn that pastor a loose right now. You will release that preacher right now. That preacher is going to preach like he was created to preach. That woman is going to flow in the gift that she's got down on the inside that nobody's ever even seen yet. I pray for every person who's been pacing in the cage, tormented by an instinct that senses there's something beyond these bars for me. I pray that they will come into a season of courage. I pray, Lord, that when they come up out of this meeting, 
it would be like Jesus coming up out of the water. I pray that the heavens would open above their head and a word of commendation would come down from heaven. And I would even ask you for the sweet presence of the Holy Spirit to descend on this room like a dove and prepare your people for what you're about to do next. That preacher's going to have to go to another service. Somebody's going to have to build a building. Somebody's about to birth a business. Somebody's about to write a book. Somebody's about to start a company. When this service is over, the next step they take will be a step in the next dimension. I declare it. I believe it. I release it. I've seen you do it for me. I've seen you do it in my life. I know you're going to do it for them. Bless them from the crown of their head to the sole of their feet. In Jesus' name, amen. Now you just thank him. Thank him. Thank him.